I'm very pleased to be joined today by Dr. Frank Richter, Chairman of Horasis, the global business community. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for inviting me, a great pleasure, and I think it's the right time to talk about risk and uh, this gloomy state of the world. Correct. Uh, Frank, you just uh, recently concluded the Horasis Annual Meeting 2012 in Zurich, Switzerland, with a theme that I think is extremely interesting, namely thriving on risk. Um, I'd love to delve into some of the takeaways from the meeting, but before we do that, would you please tell us uh, how you started Horasis and uh, what the mission of the organization is? Well, Horasis is a global business community. We organize um, five large-scale events every year focusing on emerging markets. I used to um, um, look in the world from an uh, OECD angle, um, basically North America and Europe, and um, I think everybody uh, did in the past, but now uh, the growing uh, economies of the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India and China, are taking over. Not only taking over, but they um, uh, are the new engines of growth. What we would like to provide is um, some foresight on how the world is developing and also supporting those emerging countries drive for globalization to help to, uh, to establish uh, brands overseas and also to make the world a better world. We see so many imbalances in this world. We see a lot of um, unemployment now in Europe. We see inflation uh, in Asia. We see, of course, a lot of uh, geopolitical tensions. What we really need is dialogue. We have to um, bring the different um, stakeholders together to create a platform where people can not only talk, but think about um, tangible and sustainable solutions. So the idea of Horasis really is to be a platform for dialogue. We are um, stakeholders from emerging countries, from OECD countries can meet and uh, look into um, joint projects to um, drive and towards culture um, the future. I believe that um, uh, coming together and uh, building uh, a platform for, for trust, trust building is extremely important for business as well, because nobody will go into a business today without uh, having this um, a platform for trust where people can meet and talk. Wonderful, and, and I think this last event that you just uh, concluded in Zurich um, had an amazing um, list of participants, global business leaders as well as political leaders, and uh, what struck me was just how focused the event was on practical solutions, uh, specifically the theme of thriving on risk, um, what was, was there a consensus and if so, what was it and if not, what were, what were the various views that were expressed at the meeting? It is a Horasis annual meeting with around 120 CEOs joining us from around um, 42 countries. We also got um, a few public figures involved, including the Prime Minister of Latvia, the Malaysian uh, Minister of Trade and the Minister President of Flanders. They came from all different corners, um, from all around the world, but uh, we, um, at the end of the day, we found a consensus saying that we have to join hands and to jointly think about uh, solutions. And we should stop to point fingers. It's very fashionable now to point fingers um, uh, to European leaders and saying what's happening in Europe is not good. Europe is kind of driving the world down into uh, a very bad malaise. And um, what we have to do is to regain a view on a, a balanced state of the world where both emerging countries and established countries can work together. The theme indeed was thriving on risk and uh, we looked into the different risk factors in this world today and there are many risks out there. Of course uh, the euro is a major risk, the currency in Europe, inflation I mentioned before, unemployment, social unrest um, and um, uh, what we have to do now is to have a positive attitude to thrive on risk, to understand the different risk factors and to find solutions where um, companies and societies at large can thrive and rebuild the future. So if you're a business leader today um, looking to position a global corporation to not only survive this uh, period of crisis but in fact benefit from it, what, what are some of the things you would um, think about or, or look into doing? I think uh, one important paradigm is the paradigm of um, outsourcing and offshoring. Today, 
they live in the virtual world. You can outsource and offshore almost everything, even your your headquarter, but definitely your R and D, um, your manufacturing. Take Apple for example. Apple is very much a virtual organization. Organization. They're not owning manufacturing anymore. It's all done in China or in other markets, creating employment actually in those markets, which is also good for society. And um, at the end of the day, I think we have to find solutions where um, things can done best um, at the best price in the best time somewhere in the world. And um, I think Europe um, is still very good in certain things when it comes to high tech, when it comes to research, when it comes to high end uh, brands like um, in the automotive industry, take a BMW or a Porsche. I think these things will always be here in Europe, but um, I think Europe will lose um, mass manufacturing. It's something of the past. And maybe in Europe, you have to um, consciously abandon certain sectors in manufacturing and give it to Asia, give it to the emerging countries and to find a new repartition of work uh, around the world. I think that's uh, just some, some ideas and I very much believe in virtual organizations, again, outsourcing, Globalization is key. Maybe in the future, companies might only have um, 5, 10, 100 employees uh, in a small headquarter, maybe a virtual headquarter, somebody sitting in London, somebody else in Beijing and Tokyo, and all the rest is done by other people around the world. What we really need uh, to put all this together is leadership, a strong sense for leadership, somebody with charisma leading an organization, leading a company, and being able actually to create some common values um, in this organization to get everything into one direction and to have a great value added uh, to the customers. I think in the report summarizing the findings from your annual meeting, uh, you mentioned that the last decade was widely viewed as the decade of globalization, very favorably so. Now in this decade, um, globalization has become somewhat of a, of a contested word. Um, what do you think um, business leaders can do to ensure that uh, protectionism doesn't take over because of the challenges that a lot of countries face? Globalization indeed was uh, the buzzword of um, the last decade and uh, we face now a phase of deglobalization where people even go on the street. Think about the um, Occupy Wall Street uh, movement and um, uh, people there, I think they're right, you know, if you think about all the power centered in Wall Street and um, all the other people around who can't really share this power, people think about um, the benefits of globalization, if benefits really are out there and if um, benefits, um, benefits of globalization can spur the world into the right uh, direction. I believe that uh, globalization is here to stay. I think we can't um, uh, put it back. Uh, we can't um, go back to the nation state. We can't go back uh, to a world where, um, you know, countries fight against each other. Companies are always in stringent competition. What we need is a world of cooptation, where competition and cooperation uh, coexist. And um, I feel that um, globalization uh, doesn't have to mean that everybody is eating the same kind of food or drinks the same kind of drinks. Still, we have uh, our local food, and I think we should be proud of our of our local food, of our local taste, of our local ambitions. Um, but still, in a globalized world, we uh, can we can try to give uh, the benefits to all the actors involved, and it's um, not a zero sum game. I believe it's um, a positive sum game where everybody can win. Many of our viewers um, are shareholders of global corporations um, that that operate in some jurisdictions that have had some issues, uh, such as China or Russia. What is your view on how those countries that need to catch up can best do so, and are you optimistic that they indeed will uh, join the global community in all aspects, including uh, legal and shareholder rights? See, we uh, host every year um, um, the four big country meetings um, exactly on the smart as you mentioned, on China, on Russia, India, and the Middle East. And when you look from a New York or London perspective, of course you will see that they're not using the so-called Anglo-Saxon model, um, very much based on uh, transparency, shareholder rights, good corporate governance. Um, so I think um, uh, uh, the so-called Asian model um, is, uh, or maybe the model of state capitalism, is even competing with the Anglo-Saxon model. 
Um, but I see that many Chinese companies, let's talk about China for a second, are trying to adopt uh, a more Western model uh, as they are now going for IPOs listings outside China. It's quite fashionable to list in London, New York or Frankfurt or even Zurich. And here, of course, have to comply with uh, best global standards. I think um, the pendulum is kind of swinging back and forth. You know, sometimes we feel a bit more the Anglo-Saxon, sometimes more the Chinese model. And maybe the truth is in between. Uh, the, the true strength of the Chinese model actually is a very long-term perspective. In the Anglo-Saxon model, you have a very short-term orientation. You have to boost your share price. And just if I would say it's black and white, it's sometimes better to fire people to, to boost your share price. At least in the past, it was always perceived to be good news. But uh, maybe it's bad news for the people uh, involved and for the um, uh, productivity of your, your company. In the Chinese ways, uh, managers and owners very much look into uh, long-term development and even in um, a kind of co-development with society. I've been to um, Shanghai recently and I went to an interesting place called the Museum on the Future. It's uh, basically a museum where you can see how Shanghai and China will look like in around 40, 50 years from now. I believe, you know, this kind of view is not really existing in the Western world, where we always go for quarterly reporting and uh, the boosting of our share price. So again, I think the truth might be in between, and I would wish that we in the Anglo-Saxon world would also adopt some elements of the Chinese or Asian model. Mm -hmm. And um, talking about imbalances that exist not only um, among countries, but also within countries and among folks of different um, economic um, fortunes. Were there any um, ideas for how to deal with those imbalances and bring them perhaps in line with historical norms? Um, what, what came out of the meeting on, on that topic? And there was a very interesting uh, discussion with the Prime Minister of Latvia, and you know that Latvia it was one of the first countries going into a very deep structural crisis in uh, 2008 when the crisis um, came over from uh, the Atlantic and hit Europe. Uh, Latvia was hit first and uh, um, I think in 2008-2009 uh, the GDP um, shrank by around 15%. Uh, uh, what uh, the Prime Minister, a very young Prime Minister, uh, um, in his mid-30s did in, uh, in the beginning actually was to cut expenditure and uh, fiscal austerity. Austerity was really uh, the talk of the day. Today, actually, everybody uh, wants to copy Latvia and uh, is not actually able to do so. You know, Greece has a lot of um, issues. People go on the street. But Latvia really was driving it through and was able to refix um, the, the economy. Uh, imbalances, yes, Latvia had um, uh, very you know, important and um, uh, striking uh, imbalances. But now I think, you know, the crisis is over in Latvia and uh, Latvia is slowly growing again. And maybe it's a better Latvia now with a stronger middle class. Before we had um, a few of those uh, so-called oligarchs you find in uh, most um, Eastern European countries, very wealthy entrepreneurs and almost no middle class. Uh, and uh, the big chunk of society actually was poor, living on um, maybe uh, three, four hundred euro per month. Now we see um, uh, a rising middle class and uh, Latvia was able to boost um, uh, middle class and to shrink the, the imbalances. I wish you know other countries would copy this model, but you need really a, a social contract where everybody is behind this model, behind this proposal, and you need a very good um, leadership from the top. I'm sure there was also discussion of some of the problem economies within the EU and, and what how those uh, debt <coughs> issues and other issues might get resolved. Uh, was there a consensus on what is likely to happen in Europe or and also on what should happen? It's a very interesting question actually. You know we had um, people from 42 countries as I mentioned before and uh, I think you can't really reach a consensus when it comes to Greece for example. You know the country really in uh, uh, the center of the discussion most of our uh, American friends actually was uh, that just said, let them go. There's no way uh, to throw money after Greece. You know, uh, the country is, is basically bankrupt and uh, you should stop and go for a fresh start. And maybe viewing Greece as a new emerging country where many things are possible, where maybe Chinese investors might come in, maybe Russians come in and um, 
um, have a, a different migration policy and uh, buy real estate on uh, some Greek islands. So maybe a, a new model for Greece. Uh, this was a view of our American friends. Most Europeans at the meeting had the idea of um, further supporting the meeting, out of uh, for supporting Greece out of solidarity, saying we can't let them go. It's it's impossible, you know. If Greece is falling, the whole of Europe might fall. Uh, the few participants from Asia, Africa, Latin America, uh, they actually um, uh, supported more the American view and say, you know, what's happening in Europe. Um, might even train down the rest of the world and uh, we have to fix the problem but I think fixing Greece is almost impossible so let them go and try to keep the large economies of Spain, Italy, Ireland even France of course is facing now some difficulties keeping them afloat and trying to um, uh, keep together the rest of the Eurozone. Um, in, in your report um, you say that the outlook for 2012 was um, rather cautious among uh, many of the business leaders. Um, why do you think that is? And if we do have a major global recession in 2012, what should be the policy response? I think there will be a, a recession. We're already feeling it now here in Europe. There's some optimistic um, signals in the US. You know, the employment uh, figures are actually quite, quite good. Um, and uh, we see um, a divide between Europe uh, and the rest of the world. Some people call actually um, uh, the time we are facing in Europe a uh, so-called lost decade. Remember what happened in Japan uh, 20 years ago? It was like a, a balance sheet recession, some people said. No growth, stagnation, deflation, um, and uh, basically um, also silvering of society, not enough um, young kids um, and um, of course huge pension fund uh, liabilities, uh, a lost decade. Uh, Japan for the first time actually is now um, a trade balance um, deficit and it was always uh, on the contrary. And you see what can happen uh, to Europe, I think, just following this Japanese model. And I'm not sure, you know, really how to solve it. I think what we have to do maybe is to rethink our whole uh, social framework here in Europe. You know, when we see what's happening on a Friday afternoon. People go back, uh, uh, they leave uh, the office uh, at around uh, maybe one o'clock, even earlier. They go to the mountains, to the lakes, to the seashore and uh, come back on Monday morning during the weekend. People usually even not using their blackberries. That's a bit the European uh, attitude. And uh, very long vacations, six to seven weeks. I think we have to change this to be more competitive and going back to a two to three weeks vacation type of schedule and we have to uh, rediscover our hard work. I think that's what we did 50 years ago after the war. And uh, we lost it because, you know, we are a bit of uh, complacent now and uh, we are we're getting very, very lazy. It seems that we've, we've learned how to live the good life when uh, a lot of people in Asia are working uh, very hard at reaching the <coughs> standard of living that we enjoy in Europe. Um, do you think that these very difficult structural issues and also just issues of mentality um, can be fixed and how do you go about trying to do that? I think it all starts with um, education. If you look into the vision of a young European, young American, maybe is to um, um, go into the healthcare business to be maybe like a ski uh, instructor and uh, to enjoy life. Uh, in, in Asia it's quite different. Maybe read the famous book called uh, The Tiger Mom, which mm -hmm. is written by um, a Chinese American saying that, you know, hard work, uh, it's the way to go. And from a very young age, basically pushing your kids to learn the piano, to, to um, go to a school, to learn languages. And uh, we are not doing this in Europe uh, anymore. Of course, there's always the elite, people going to Oxford, Stanford uh, and Harvard, but it's just uh, a minority. But what I see now, it's very interesting that even Asians now are discovering the European style of life. Uh, I go to China quite often and I see that the young couples during the weekend go shopping. And shopping really is uh, uh, shopping for European luxury goods. And they're spending money, they're now uh, spending a lot of money to travel. And what I see also is that in some coastal areas in, in Asia, in China, work is getting too expensive. And um, work is now shifting to places like Vietnam, Indonesia, uh, even Laos, and uh, maybe recently to Myanmar. Uh, so Chinese now start to outsource and offshore and they start to enjoy life. So we see a circle 
and I would not be you know surprised to see China maybe in 10 15 years um, experiencing the same kind of problems we have in good old Europe um, you know there have been some academic um, papers or, or, or concepts around is there another way to measure um, how well an economy or a country is doing rather than just <coughs> looking narrowly at GDP and perhaps including some other measures like quality of life or quality of the environment. Uh, we know in some emerging countries um, economic growth has come at quite high a price and in some inner cities it's the, the air quality is very low. Um, <clears throat> what's your view on, on some kind of a more holistic perhaps assessment of how well the world is doing? You know, uh, I lived in uh, Beijing in the 1990s and one reason actually, or the most important reason I left Beijing uh, was the quality of air. It's just not a place here I would like to, to stay for, um, for you know, a few more for weeks or even years. Um, so, uh, and then of course traffic, you know, traffic is something horrible in those mega cities. I just spent uh, last week in Moscow and you spend a lot of time just in traffic, uh, which is awful because you lose so much time. It's so much stress, you're always late to your appointments. So can I go to a city like Zurich or uh, to smaller places here in Europe with a high quality of life? And I think that's maybe the right measurement, not just the quantitative numbers of GDP, but measuring um, the quality of life. There's an interesting country, we all know it, it's Bhutan uh, in Asia, and they are measuring actually the, the happiness uh, in the country, saying, you know, it's important to see that uh, the citizens are happy. Uh, of course, it's very difficult to measure happiness. You know, how can you measure? And uh, you can maybe just ask, you know, how do you feel? And uh, people in Bhutan maybe can't really um, uh, give you um, a comparison because they don't really know how happy people are in the outside world. But uh, yes, I think we have to add uh, a second layer to GDP, which is measuring uh, quality of life, um, happiness, education, uh, and all that together. I've been to um, uh, another interesting place uh, recently to Macau. Uh, Macau, um, part of China, actually has the highest uh, life expectancy in the world. Uh, and maybe it's a good food because of a lot of fish and uh, good Chinese food, but it's also because there's not much stress in the city. In Hong Kong, just next door, there's a lot of stress. In Macau, it's a very easygoing life. Of course, I'm very happy to have uh, the casinos and a lot of uh, mainland Chinese come on to gamble. Uh, it's a very easygoing life, but um, I would say, why not, if an economy can grow, and uh, Macau is also a very high GDP, by, by the way, um, but um, life expectancy is very important, and um, also the social context, the time we can spend with our families, I think that's very important. Um, <clears throat> you have tremendous intelligence within your community on, on global uh, events, um, given that you really are focused on emerging markets in some of the countries that some other events perhaps neglect to some extent. I'm wondering um, what, what sorts of um, opportunities and challenges um, do you see arising from the, from the Arab Spring and <clears throat> some of those folks finally um, starting to live in freedom? You know, we uh, originally um, did events on China, India and Russia, so the BRIC countries. The B is still missing, actually, in America we are working on. But uh, from the beginning we said we should also include the Arab countries. And they are not really part of the BRICs, it's a different kind of animal. And the Arab world, in a way, is divided. We have the poor countries of um, Northern Africa, of the Levante countries, and of course the Gulf countries. Take um, Doha um, uh, and Abu Dhabi, two of the wealthiest cities uh, on earth and actually Qatar is now the richest country uh, country um, um, uh, on earth so uh, quite quite a spread uh, around the Arab world and we've seen still there's quite uh, the same model um, in, in those countries where you have a very strong government which is not uh, democratically elected and uh, this led to um, uh, of course difficulties in terms of uh, human rights in terms of expression of your views in terms of even uh, entrepreneurship as many of those countries are state-driven with large um, mm -hmm. state-owned uh, economies. When we created our Global Arab Business Meeting in 2010, it's held actually in the UAE, in the Emirates, we had the uh, issue of education, 
the issue of uh, participation in society very high on the agenda. And we have been very lucky to work with uh, the ruler of Ras al Khaima, one of the Emirates, uh, to work on the agenda and try to spur development um, uh, not only in the OE but around in the Arab world, focusing on education. And we've been launching several initiatives around education where young people, young people in the Arab world can really grasp now opportunities and uh, realize their dreams. What we see now in this uh, so-called Arab Spring, and it's actually not a, a spring anymore, it's a very cold winter, um, because we see that in most um, countries the Arab Spring movement came to a halt. Take Egypt, uh, Mubarak is gone, but um, the military took over. Now we just elected um, a new government, but we really don't know yet the direction. We don't know if it's um, a very um, um, uh, um, um, extremist government or is it more like a liberal government. So it's still all open and I wish uh, the Arab region all the best. Uh, and if you can uh, give and make a small contribution uh, to the betterment of the situation, we will do it as for us. Is because we invite uh, the main business leaders from the region to join hands and to think about strategies, how to overcome youth unemployment and to give the Arab world uh, a new economic hope. Economically, the Gulf countries have really excelled over the past decade. Um, do you th believe that they have diversified in some respects, um, perhaps a <coughs> little bit away from oil and gas, or are they going to be in a lot of trouble if there is a downturn in the energy markets? Right, some of the countries definitely diversified. Uh, take Dubai, for example. Dubai very much went into the whole area of tourism lifestyle, um, but also IT, education, and new industries. Uh, some people say that uh, Dubai even um, diversified too much, putting too much uh, money into the sand. Um, I think Dubai went the right way because, you know, you can't just live from your oil and gas reserves. You need more and you need to develop a sustainable model for your economies uh, to thrive also in the future. Um, now, um, I see um, some um, countries, and you mentioned um, Qatar before, uh, trying to um, uh, build very much um, strength in research and development. Um, there's, uh, for example, the Science and Development Foundation in, uh, in Doha, where now uh, a lot of uh, multinationals actually put their R&D facilities uh, into Doha. And uh, Doha itself uh, also trying to diversify uh, by using its own sovereign wealth fund, investing into the car industry in Europe, investing into the chemical industry, investing into the IT industry. So I think it's the right thing to do, and um, of course uh, those countries are also lucky as they have got the money to do it. But they should maybe also support some of their poorer neighbors in the Arab world, um, including Egypt, Levant, Morocco, uh, Tunisia, uh, and uh, of course now Libya. Libya needs to be reconstructed, and I think the Arab League uh, should take a major role in reconstructing Libya, and maybe Syria in the future, you know, helping the Arab peers to, um, to grow. Um, let's talk just a, a bit about Russia. You have the uh, Global Russia Business Meeting uh, in Luxembourg this year. Um, recently, equity market valuations have been very low in Russia um, due to corporate governance concerns. What's your view on whether Russia is going forward <coughs> truly and how it can go there? What's your view on, on the likely political landscape, perhaps looking a couple of years out, and then um, how the businesses in Russia are, are evolving? Well, I'm just uh, back from Russia and uh, some fresh thoughts on what happened. I even experienced the, the protests on the streets of Moscow uh, last Saturday, and you feel there's um, certainly some change in the air. People are, you know, trying to, to see where the future Russia will, will be going, you know, which direction uh, President Medvedev was talking about uh, modernization a lot and saying Russia is too much depending on oil and gas and he's right to think so and he's putting a lot of efforts into um, trying to build an IT sector, a st strong R&D base in Russia. Maybe you heard about uh, the Skolkovo project which is uh, a large cluster of IT development similar to the Silicon Valley or uh, Rosnano, the same thing in the area of uh, biotechnology. So they're trying to diversify the economy and um, uh, I think it's the right thing to do because still now today, Russia's uh, economy is so much depending on the oil price. Uh, when the oil price is, is going up, Russia's economy is doing very well. 
maybe growing even in the area of seven, eight, nine percent. When the oil price is down, it's uh, suddenly and immediately uh, a minus close. So uh, Russia has to balance it, and Russia has to uh, find new um, governance structures. Uh, a bit uh, adopting the Western model, we talked about it before, and uh, going for better global governance. When you look from the outside world, uh, you feel that um, FDI, foreign direct investment in Russia, could be much, much better. It's a um, lack of trust in the Russian uh, rule of law. Many foreign direct investors go through China, go to Indonesia, go to other countries. But Russia is such a wealthy country, such a uh, highly educated country, and it shows much more uh, FDI. I think uh, Russia should uh, actively attract FDI and uh, work on those investment conditions. I know that, for example, um, uh, the Vice Prime Minister Shuvalov is working with it and uh, is going even like on investor tours around the world, meeting uh, large um, companies and, and trying to convince them to invest into Russia. And we see some first results, some automotive um, companies now setting up operations in Russia. The pharmaceutical sector is very strong in Russia. Uh, what Russia has to do now is to develop also its own brands. There are not many Russian brands, maybe beside uh, the vodka, uh, beside um, uh, some other areas from the Soviet period. Uh, but there are some players like um, Kaspersky Software. Kaspersky Software uh, is one of the uh, most famous software in the antivirus area. It's of Russian origin and uh, it's a global brand. And I think Russia needs much more, many more brands uh, like that Kaspersky in the future. Um, Frank, you've built a, a truly unique platform with Horasis. Um, how can global business leaders become involved with your organization? Horasis is a very open organization, so we invite um, CEOs of large companies, but also CEOs of um, smaller companies, startup companies. We don't have really a um, uh, um, bottom line or like... Um, um, uh, the, the line saying you have to have at least four to five to ten billion turnover. We invite everybody uh, who is interesting and interested uh, in what we do. And uh, the most important thing is to contribute to the discussions and to our projects. We very much focus on China, India, Russia, the Middle East, but we are also planning activities focusing on Latin America and on Africa in the future. So we are really the I think maybe the only platform in the world um, all encompassing emerging markets uh, trying to help them to grow into um, uh, true global multinationals but also helping multinationals to invest in those countries. I mentioned Russia before trying to work on the um, uh, uh, investment climate uh, in a country like Russia. I think we can do it uh, because we are independent, we are Swiss based, we are not working on behalf of a government. Still. We have a very benign approach. We work together with governments and trying to join hands uh, to improve investment conditions. So uh, very much, um, I would say, welcome uh, to CEOs from emerging countries, uh, from Europe, from North America as well. And we would really like uh, to create the new platform for dialogue and for business. As you as mentioned earlier, there are really five major events. Uh, you do the annual meeting in Zurich, the... Um, Russia business meeting, the global India business meeting, the global China business meeting, and the global Arab business meeting. Um, where should business leaders go to actually contact you and become involved with those events? Well, we've got uh, our website, verasis.org. Uh, all the information is on the website. Uh, what is uh, really happening now, we are not doing advertising. We are not uh, promoting um, uh, the meetings in a big way, uh, what's happening now is really um, the power of the word of mouth. People are talking about it and people usually um, uh, get in other friends, CEOs uh, involved in these meetings. So the meetings are growing every year. We have uh, three to four hundred uh, participants and the meetings are always hosted outside the country in focus. So the China meeting uh, was hosted in Valencia in Spain last year. This year will be held in Riga in Latvia. We're always going for unusual uh, places. You know, Chinese CEOs usually are not going to Latvia. But uh, this is a very fact why it's so interesting for them to go. Discovering no new business opportunities and, uh, you know, trying to um, find peers in those respective countries. The host governments like Latvia, like Spain, are very much involved in the process of setting up the meeting. Usually a prime minister or a minister is welcoming 
participants from China, India, Russia, or the Arab world. But it's not only a bilateral meeting, it's really a, a global meeting. We have participants from all around the world uh, joining us. I remember at our last um, China meeting in Spain, we got quite a good number of participants from Latin America, which is obvious because it was held in Spain, and from Africa. So many Africans flew into Valencia to meet Chinese CEOs. So we see really the true global nature of these meetings. And uh, we try um, to be uh, very, um, um, uh, in a way, um, heterogeneous because we want to have different actors attending. From China, we have both the state-owned sector and the private sector attending. And sometimes we feel that those Chinese companies meet for the first time at our meeting uh, because the state-owned players and the private players are totally different, a different world. But we combine them in one meeting uh, when we uh, gather uh, on an annual basis. So we would like to continue this model. And um, I think um, over the years, uh, the uh, meetings build a certain brand. In China, uh, many of the leading Chinese CEOs know about the meeting and uh, even knock on the door. So it's not that we have to push participants to come. On the contrary, they want to come and, uh, and join us. And we have to keep the meeting still small and intimate. If the meeting uh, is growing, it's getting bigger, I think you lose a bit the, the intimacy. And we think the size of three to 400 CEOs is just the right size, where we can still meet, talk, and uh, become friends. And, and that's really what struck me, I think. Um, if events become too big, they become essentially photo opportunities, but the real hard work, it strikes <coughs> me, is getting done at events such as the Horasis meetings. And, uh, and so I'm very encouraged to see so many business leaders from around the world getting together and actually working on some of the hard problems that we're facing. I think it's really key and it's maybe um, uh, the key to uh, create this um, atmosphere of, uh, of friends, of peers who meet in a, in a way like uh, gathering around a fireplace atmosphere. Uh, we don't really uh, uh, script our sessions too much. We just put people into the room. It's very open and free willing uh, discussions. Of course, there are other big meetings around in the world. There's a big meeting happening here in the Swiss Alps every year. And I believe those meetings are just getting too big. And, uh, you know, uh, there are maybe 30 or 40 prime ministers coming in and they just go for the next big headline in the media. And uh, what we want to do really is, is to, um, to work and uh, to provide solutions uh, at the end of the day where everybody in the room can, can participate. So that's a bit the... Uh, our model and I think uh, we're on the right way and the right avenue. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for your time. I really endorse your mission and you. Uh, wish you continued success uh, with Horasis. Thanks so much, John. I appreciate it.